You as a critic are going to uh, head the FIPRI SG jury at uh, Cannes Film Festival 2021. So are you the first Israeli critic to uh, have this honor? To my knowledge, yes. I, there were Israeli critics that were on the jury in the Cannes Film Festival, but not as a president of the jury. Mm -hmm. And because Cannes is the most important film festival in the world, I'm very honored to get this nomination from Fipresk. And uh, I'm very honored to have you in my show. And I think that Fipresci is, uh, uh, you know, like more objective, in my opinion. Because most of yeah. the main jury are part of the industry. Yes. Most of them are directors or actors or producers. As you say, they, they know the people that uh, they're making judgment on. And we can be more objective because most of us are film critics and that's what we do in our everyday life. So that's maybe more professional in our point of view or something like that. I want to emphasize your uh, uh, background. You come from a diplomatic family actually and then you became a lawyer and then you became a critic. Can you tell us more about uh, your life uh, up until the point you became professional film critic. Well, uh, my parents have a big law firm, and uh, my uh, actually my stepfather was the honorary counsel of Paraguay in Israel for many years. Now my ma he passed away ten years ago, and now my mother is the honorary counsel of Paraguay. So I know the diplomatic life, a lot of traveling outside of Israel, etc. But most of them, the, both of them are law. Uh, my stepfather was deceased and my mother, she's still practicing law. So it was obvious for me that I was going to study law. And that's what I did. First I learned political science. I had my degree in political science and I continued the, as to study law. And actually, I've been practicing law since 1997, until three years ago. And uh, it wasn't that fun as I imagined, I have to tell you. And uh, about uh, 15 years ago, I started doing uh, uh, film criticism as a hobby. Uh, I started to write in a website, I didn't get any money from it. It was a hobby, and then I gave a lecture here and a lecture there. I didn't think about it this seriously, but one thing led to another, and uh, about th 13 years ago, I was approached by Israeli television and radio to become their film critic, with, which made it a, a bit more serious, you can say. It's, it wasn't a part-time job, or say, it, it was like a part-time job or something, but then I discovered that I mostly enjoy doing things con connected with cinema and not with law. So three years ago, I decided to resign from the law firm I worked with, and now I'm doing film criticism full time. I teach in Haifa University. I teach in all kinds of establishment. I am film critic of Israeli radio and television, and also the sport channel and a couple of radio station. And that's uh, the work I do now full time. And tell me, there are a lot of uh, what we say as a genre or a subgenre court dramas. And you know now both sides of the fence, you know movies and you know uh, law and courts. Uh, and for me, the best film about lawyers is To Kill a Mockingbird uh, with Gregory Peck as uh, Atticus Finch, Finch, the yeah. humble, honest lawyer and uh, who, won, who, who is fighting for justice. You know, if you ask, it's very interesting because I lecture a lot about the role of the uh, lawyer in cinema. And in the beginning, it was like this Gregory Peck character. He was the defender of the weak. But since the end of the 20th century, the lawyers became the, the bad guys in the films. You can see this in Philadelphia, you can see this in the movie with uh, Jim Carrey, Liar, Liar, that he's a lawyer, but he can't lie for a day, and that's very difficult for him. You can see it in the movie My Cousin Vinny, when a gangster becomes a lawyer. And the most, uh, you can say, bad guy that you can see 
is uh, in the devil's advocate. Al Pacino as, uh, as the main uh, uh, guy in this law firm, he's actually the devil. So if you talk about a lawyer as the devil, you can see the shift that in the beginning of the Hollywood times, the lawyer was the angel, the protector of the innocent. Nowadays, he's just a guy wanting to earn as much more money. From fighting the system, he became the system. That's very interesting about movies portraying lawyers. Your passion when we talked is, uh, is sports and movies about sports. Do you uh, like also watch sports and do you enjoy watching sports or just the movies about sports? No, no, I really like enjoying sports. I'm, I have uh, my weekly like 10 or 15 minutes every week in the sports channel when I recommend sport films. And uh, I, re I, I did a big series in this, uh, of like 30 chapters, uh, which was called the best sport films ever, mm -hmm. which I gave a short introduction. I showed you a one about Rocky and yeah. Rocky III. I gave a short introduction. I played basketball. I kicked a ball or something. It was very funny. And then they showed more than 30 films that I thought were very good sport films. And uh, what is, in your opinion, uh, what is your favorite sport movie? Uh, uh, my favorite sport movie is Rocky, actually. Mm -hmm. If you call me on my phone, you'll hear the theme song of Rocky. And that's also the theme song of my uh, radio show. And uh, this is, for me, a great film. And I think the second best sport film is The Raging Bull. Scorsese, yeah. the name of bo both of them boxing uh, uh, films. Very interesting. I guess you know the tradition of uh, boxing and chess uh, when it comes to uh, Jewish people uh, uh, bringing boxing from United Kingdom to the United States, uh, but also uh, most of the great chess players were, uh, were Jewish. That is a very, I think, uh, uh, interesting concept because one, one sport is Okay, they would say boxing is also cerebral because you have to know certain things, but uh, uh, chess is very cerebral uh, a sport. Where is, the, where is the line where, where these sports connect when it comes to uh, being very popular among, among our people in diaspora? First of all, uh, boxing and uh, chess are individual sports. Mm -hmm. It's one guy fighting the yeah. other. Mm -hmm. You can relate mm -hmm. to the good guy and hate the bad guy. It's not a team sport. Mm -hmm. It's like a Western, you can say, a sport Western. Mm -hmm. And I think boxing fits the American system very well because in the end, America is a very individual country. So, uh, and then you can talk about one guy against the other. And uh, if you talk about, uh, I, I don't remember many Jewish films about uh, boxing. There is one triumph of, of the will about this uh, guy who survived Auschwitz by fighting for the Nazis the whole time in the ah, camp. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And, and the, I'm not sure that Boxer was Jewish, but there is a movie called Looking for Bobby Fischer about uh, Jewish yes. players, etc. Yes. And uh, actually, there are not that many uh, movies about, I don't think, Jewish sports. And in Israel, there were not that many sport films made because in Israel, sport is not on that high level, you can say, and uh, which is interesting. But now they're starting also, and we'll talk later about the renaissance of the Israeli film industry, they're starting to make also sports film, which is very good and refreshing from my point of view. You told me that you don't follow like a television series uh, a lot uh, because you are mostly focused on uh, on feature movies but and I, cinema. I saw the Queen's Gambit. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, I mean, I'm not crazy about that series and I said that, it, it, yeah, but for me, uh, uh, there are two very, uh, I think, um, important figures in uh, chess and that is Bobby Fischer and on the other hand it's uh, Judith and Ruja Polgar uh, and father Polgar of course uh, but nobody depicted uh, neither uh, uh, Polgar family nor Bobby Fischer in uh, I think uh, the way that they should be treated in the movies I think that they are 
characters really for A-list directors. That is very, very, I mean, Bobby Fischer is of course controversial, but he was a genius. So they deserve a little bit more than just, let's say, B-movies or little television series. I agree or with you, but you have to remember that outside of the United States, sports films are not that popular. Not in Europe and not in other places. 90% of the sports films are made in America. So I don't know what way if a European or Israeli or Asian director will be interested in the story of Bobby Fischer and the people you mentioned. Yeah. Maybe that's why they didn't make these high profile films of them till now. You mentioned the renaissance of uh, Israeli movies as, and especially what we know in uh, uh, this part of the world television series and uh, I spoke to Avi Avner regarding some of the series in, in my interview with him and the accuracy of depicting Mossad and uh, other, other uh, agencies. The movies from the 70s and 80s, what I saw, Israeli movies were a little bit trashy. Uh, around 10 or 12 years ago, uh, with some festivals, came some new wave of Israeli cinema. Was it all of a sudden? Was it a process? No, 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 it was a process because a couple of things came together. Actually, in the 90s and in the 80s, there were, there, these are called the desert years of the Israeli cinema. Like the Sons of Israel went 40 years in the desert, the Israeli cinema was 20 years in the desert. You can say people were fed up with these comedies, and on the other hand, movies about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Mm -hmm. So they didn't go to see Israeli cinema. There were about seven or eight films produced each year. And people were not interested in Israeli cinema. That's why in 1999, uh, there was the Love Cinema in Israel that managed to get a lot of money to the industry through some film funds. Mm -hmm. And then the Israeli cinema got a lot of boost. And also, I don't know if you can say normal, but after many years that in Israeli cinema, they talked about the Israeli-Arab conflict or the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. They started to talk about everyday life, talk about someone. They, uh, there were two movies especially, which is called Late Marriage by Dovar Kozashvili, who talked about the Georgian family in Israel. The other film was called Broken Wings, it's about a family that the father of the family na dies, not in a battle, he's not a hero, he's stung by a bee. He just uh -huh. gets stung by a bee and dies, that's simple. And then his family struggles to survive. These two films started what we call now the, Israeli, the new Israeli renaissance. Suddenly, 20, 25, 30, 40 films were made. For a country of 9 million people now, it's quite a lot. And the movie were made about many subjects. Sports, gay and lesbian, not only the Israeli-Arab conflicts, and also the comedies came back after many years, but, but the, the cinema became more sophisticated. And you can see that Israeli movies became successful. A footnote by Joseph Seder won the script in Cannes, was in the five last nominees for the best foreign film before went to the Oscar, Ajami, which was an interesting film. He didn't talk about the conflict in a country, but he talked about Jaffa, a country, a, a city with yeah. Jews and Arabs trying to live together, not the big conflict. But that was very interesting. It reminded people, this movie reminded people of uh, uh, the, the Brazilian film, Children of God. Yeah. Uh, about the favelas in Rio yeah, de Janeiro. Yeah. By the way, there are more than 20 film schools in Israel. That's crazy for this small country. But a lot of people want to go and learn film and they succeed in doing it also outside of Israel, which is great for me as a film critic. I'm very proud, you could say. You told me that you uh, uh, really follow and that uh, the the Asian movie and uh, as you as you said Pacific movie movies are uh, your 
cup of tea. Asian cinema, probably by chance I saw this Korean film late at night at 3 o'clock at the cables or something and I said to myself that I see something unusual and uh, for me the, the volume, the volume is very different in Asian cinema. It's more loud, more high emotions, the colors are different, the aesthetic is different and I, I think that it's less filterized than Western cinema. It's for me, it's less commercial. And I think that the directors sometimes go all the way and are not afraid to, to go to the edge. I really like the connection also between East and West. If you take uh, Ujimbo, you come to a few dollars more. Seven Samurai, The Magnificent Seven, uh, George Lucas was influenced by the Hidden Fortress when he made Star Wars, etc., etc. And I'm especially interested in the in two characters, the samurai and the cowboy, which has a lot of things in parallel. Because I'm very I write, I like westerns very much. Yeah, you told so me I that. I also like samurai films. So I like movies from Japan, Korea, China. I really like martial art films because I really like dancing and for me martial art is like dancing. So also these movies, when I watch them I feel like a seven year old or something. I forget everything. If you remember the scene in the movie Ratatouille, mm -hmm. when the, the critic eats the, the thing that Remy cooked for him, there is a scene that he flashbacks to his childhood and he remembers that his mother gave him this Ratatouille. So when I watch a martial art film, I feel like I'm seven or eight. That happens to me also when I see a Western film. Face Off is one of my favorite movies and... Uh, John Woo. Yeah, John Woo. And I think that is uh, one of the best combinations between two worlds. In uh, former Yugoslavia, uh, boys and girls and everyone, we went to the movies and we saw Bruce Lee's movies. And when, then after, after the film, you start doing this you know, like trying Kung Fu, Karate or something like that. So we were also as a kids uh, very crazy about uh, martial arts. I have to tell you one thing that, uh, that when you talk about martial arts films, I'm a film critic and I'm mm -hmm. considered a very serious film critic. Mm -hmm. And when I see a film that I don't like, I say that I don't like it. And I say this is anti-cinema, this is very bad. <laughs> I can be me, but for me, uh, the pu pure cinema is actually not artistic, it's fun. You go and forget everything for one hour and a half or two hours. And martial arts films and western films are pure fun. And John Woo films are fun. John Woo doesn't want to get you, that you will get out of the cinema and think, what is the end of the film? <laughs> This character was too sophisticated for me. No, he knows that you bought a ticket to forget about life for a while. And that's for me is pure cinema. You also mentioned Western. I think this genre never dies. Mm -hmm. It's the ultimate fight between good and bad, between chaos and order. And it's something very deep. It's, it's, it's the ultimate hero in the end. The, the, the character of the cowboy is so much interesting. It's a guy who uses violence to keep the peace. When you think about it more, when you scratch the surface, it's so interesting. And, and by the way, the Wild West is, is a cinematic invention. It never, it never was like this. And that's what nice, uh, Westerns sell you the illusion and cinema is an illusion. Regarding Westerns, I, uh, one of the, the colleagues, he wrote that Nomadland, and for me, it, it was also a Western. It's like a Western. Yeah, it's like a Western because it is a Wild West 
and it is our hero going into the sunset alone at the end of this movie we don't know her fate but we understand there is a long journey she was discovering america and this uh, new frontiers and now she is open up to some new adventures and there can be in uh, hypothetically speaking nomadland too <laughs> but uh, uh, but uh, uh, you told me that your favorite western is searchers still yes, sir, sir. yes. yes. so what do you think about uh, uh, re revisionism regarding the uh, now, uh, this thing with the Gone with the Wind? It's a good question if you're talking about uh, measuring a movie after so many years. Mm -hmm. When Gone with the Wind was produced in 1939, America was still very racist. I don't know if nowadays they're not still very racist. But, uh, Parts of it, yes, yeah. Mm Hattie -hmm. McDonald that won the Oscar, the first Afro-American lady that won an Oscar, she wasn't allowed in the hall to yeah. give the yeah. Oscars. She had to sit uh, in the back, mm -hmm. and they, like either or something, which is ludicrous. But for those days, I think it was one of the best films ever made, maybe the greatest film ever. Uh, and nowadays when you show it, times have changed. You have other perspectives. It's like you, you talk about... Uh, I forgot the name of the film, uh, Birth of a Nation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which David Borg Griffith, uh, yes. Ultra right wing film yeah. that glorifies the Klu Klux Klan. Yeah. But it was the first film that was shown in the White House, and Griffith said that he apologized after he did this film. And nowadays, nobody almost ever screens it, but it's still considered one of the first groundbreaking films narrative, editing, etc., etc. When I teach about uh, political assassinations, I show the scene in this film when they, when they shoot, uh, uh, when Booth shoots Lincoln in the theater, because this is a great uh, making of how do you shoot a, poli a political assassination. And uh, Hitchcock in The Man Who Knew Too Much made the same scene. Yeah, actually. with the bomb, yeah. Yeah, yeah, with, yeah, with the gun that's going like this, like mm. in Birth of a Nation when he puts the gun like this, it's almost the same scene, mm. 50 years later, so these films, The Gone in the Wind, The Birth of a Nation, you cannot deny them, you cannot erase them, they are very influential in cinematic uh, point of view, the races, the, 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 uh, the, the things that you, you, you understand from them are very problematic, but if from a cinematic point of view they are very good, so we don't have to hide them. We have to understand the times that they were made and understand that, that there were other times back then. But uh, what do you think about this uh, approach that, I mean, for me, it is positive. And I wrote that it is positive to have a foreword by film scholars before showing uh, uh, Gone with the Wind uh, to the audience. To, 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 to make them understand that in those days to see the slave owners as the best people in the world mm -hmm. and the slaves were very happy to be slaves that was a concept that in those days was still happening in the states of course nowadays it's super ra racist to even think about it but those were totally different times yeah, because uh, many critics uh, uh, said, oh, uh, this political correctness is going to kill us, it's, it's not good that we have a forward or that we have somebody. And then I said and I wrote, and what about Lenny Riefenstahl? What about that? Because it is comparable. And you don't show a, 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 a triumph of the will or you don't show Olympia like without any context. When you come from Mars and see these movies and they show uh, like very beautiful scenes and uh, 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 swimming pools. But what, uh, what is the context of that is extremely problematic. Of course, but this, this, these are excellent docker sports. She's considered the pioneer of docker sports actually, where she placed the cameras, how she shot many people in a stadium. This is marvelous. Of course, the, the, the things that you see from this film is very, very problematic. 
it's very fascist, it's about pro-Nazi, etc. But if you look in it also in a cinematic point of view, this is very good uh, movie, uh, cinematic work. She knew her work, actually. I, I saw a uh, documentary about her. I, I don't think that she ever really showed some kind of regret uh, regarding her work in Nazi propaganda. But in my opinion, uh, slavery and racism in the United States and the Holocaust and everything that happened is comparable when it comes to giving forwards or giving uh, context to, to, uh, to, to some work and uh, it's not a stupid political correctness. I want to end this on a, let's say, a positive, a nice note and to, to, to wish you a good time in, uh, in uh, Cannes. I will be honored to meet Spike Lee as the head of the main jury in Cannes because he's one of my idols. I think his movie, Do the Right Thing, is one of the best things that I saw in my life, I tell you. This is an unbelievable thing. I uh, I was not I, I was not crazy about Spike Lee until uh, uh, 25th hour, and then I became like a, a, a super fan. But after I saw Black Klansman, I was rooting so much for him to get an Oscar because uh, Black Klansman is absolute masterpiece in every way. You know, to 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 tell such a, a serious story in. Uh, uh, a bit of humoristic way that is a work of a genius and I understand why he was so pissed off that he didn't get one by the way in the beginning of uh, Black Landsman he shows scene from Gone with the Wind yes he shows a scene from Birth of a Nation. Nation yes and we are closing the circles in this interview yes yes with the, I, I think Alec Baldwin is uh, one of the uh, uh, white supremacists explaining and he's talking about Afro-Americans and Jews, if you remember. Of course, because Adam Driver is actually playing uh, a, a, a Jewish policeman, police officer. He's opening a can, I have to tell you. Uh, yeah, uh, Leo Skarax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I envy you so much. Now I have to, to finish this because... <laughs> <laughs> Okay, this was a very, very fun, uh, fun interview for me and uh, I hope that uh, maybe we can uh, uh, catch you later, Alligator, in August so you can give us a glimpse of what happened in Cannes, like 10, ten minutes. So, uh, thank you very much and uh, it's late, it's, uh, what time is it in Israel? So, now, now it's... Now it's almost time for Lila Tov. So, yes. yes. Tov. Yeah. So it was very enjoyable for me. So, we'll keep in touch. Yes, we will. Thank, Thank you and Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom.